Bom dia a todos e todas. É um prazer ter aqui conosco no evento a professora Ana Stetsenko e o professor Peter Smagorinsky. Eu sou Elizabeth Braga, da Universidade de São Paulo, e eu vou apresentar os dois professores é, rapidamente, nós estamos um pouco atrasados, né? Ana Stetsenko é professora catedrática de Psicologia e Educação Urbana no Centro de Pós-Graduação da Universidade da Cidade de Nova York. Trabalhou anteriormente em importantes centros de investigação e universidades da Europa, incluindo Suíça, Alemanha, Áustria e Rússia. Publicou amplamente sobre desenvolvimento humano e educação em várias línguas, inglês, russo, italiano e alemão, e é uma especialista em Vygotsky e teorias socioculturais sobre desenvolvimento e educação. Enraizada no marxismo e no projeto de Vygotsky, as suas obras fazem avançar este projeto e realçam a sua vertente político-crítica, ao mesmo tempo que se ligam a projetos críticos contemporâneos de resistência e ativismo. O seu recente livro, The Transformative Mind, Expanding Vygotsky's Approach to Development and Education, da Cambridge University Press, de 2016, reúne e examina criticamente um vasto espectro de abordagens para desenvolver uma posição ativista transformativa original e uma pedagogia da ousadia, usando aí né, um termo de Paulo Freire. É, a professora Ana ela trabalha na perspectiva ético-ontoepistemológica da pesquisa, que vai contra o modelo tradicional de ciência, que é um dos pilares da agenda neoliberal. E conforme destacado por ela, no material que acabou de ser publicado pela Amped este ano, que são é, e-books né, publicados é, em edição coordenada pelo professor e meu amigo Jefferson Mainardes, esse e-book se chama Ética e Pesquisa em Educação, no qual ela tem dois verbetes, um é, como autora e outro em coautoria com Eduardo Viana, a professora Ana vai dizer que, sob a bandeira da objetividade, da validade e do rigor científico, que permitem que a ciência permaneça neutra e distante da ideologia e da política, contra esse tipo de pesquisa, ela lança um manifesto, eu diria, a favor de uma, pes de uma pesquisa engajada, comprometida com os valores humanos, em que a ética vem em primeiro plano. Para ela, cada teoria possui um etos sociopolítico, valores e orientações. A professora Ana Stetsenko tem um posicionamento ativista transformador, expandindo dialeticamente o marxismo. Essa é a sua meta. Inspirada em Vygotsky e Freire, ela propõe a sua a sua a continuação né da, da, da teorização dos dois para ela Vygotsky foi um filósofo um, um filósofo e um psicólogo comprometido com a ação transformação essa dimensão transformadora segundo ela precisa ser resgatada para a atualidade daí sua ênfase ao conceito de agência ou agency em inglês né e Paulo Freire, para ela, foi um pedagogo e filósofo comprometido com a ação transformação também, a educa... considerando a educação como ato político, como uma atividade sempre coletiva. Então, para a professora, a agência é o nexo de pessoas juntas criando o mundo e elas sendo criadas nesse mesmo processo. Bom, o professor Peter Smagorinsky é um renomado professor e pesquisador no Departamento de Linguagem e de Letramento da Universidade da Geórgia, professor emérito. 
e ele é um, também um renomado professor visitante da Universidade de Guadalajara, em Jalisco, México. Os prêmios recentes que ele recebeu incluem o prêmio da Liga Horace Mann, de 2020, ao notável educador público, o Prêmio da Federação Internacional para o Ensino de Inglês, em 2018, e o reconhecimento como Distinguished Scholar de 2018 pela Conferência Nacional na Pesquisa em Linguagem e Literacy Education. A sua pesquisa e o seu ensino têm uma abordagem sociocultural a questões de alfabetização, letramento, formação de professores alfabetizadores e professores de ensino de língua e preocupações sociais relacionadas. Ele disse para nós que um dia ele gostaria muito de visitar pessoalmente o Brasil e discutir essas questões com seus novos colegas. O professor Peter ele trabalha com psicologia e educação e ensino de inglês. Ele é, escreve também sobre métodos de pesquisa nas ciências sociais, ensino e aprendizagem, identidade docente, teoria cultural da leitura, baseando-se na teoria da atividade e semiótica cultural, especificamente no pensamento de Vygotsky sobre sentido e significado e zona transacional, e trabalha também com a questão do letramento e da construção de conhecimento. Em um recente texto, ele vai discutir a zona de desenvolvimento proximal ou iminente de Vygotsky e a de andame instrucional, o scaffolding, de, do, usada pelo Brunner e outros autores. Segundo ele, colocar esses conceitos como sendo a mesma coisa trivializa o conceito de Vygotsky e o reduz a uma ideia pedagógica rápida, negligenciando seu lugar no projeto do autor em uma teoria histórico-social-cultural da mediação no desenvolvimento humano. Peter também trabalha com a questão da arte, do drama e peregivane do ator. É, eu espero que eu tenha apresentado bem esses dois renomados professores tão importantes para a perspectiva histórico-cultural e para a nossa discussão aqui no Brasil e no mundo. É, nessa mesa, eles vão apresentar pontos de vista distintos sobre os dois autores homenageados neste evento, Levi Vygotsky e Paulo Freire cujas práticas e teorias revolucionárias impulsionam nossas pesquisas e nosso fazer cotidiano educativo. É, eu gostaria de pedir, então, que alguém da organização nos passe o vídeo que o professor Peter nos encaminhou com a sua fala. Elizabeth, are you waiting for me to speak? Peter, we are waiting for your video. Oh, I okay. think some, someone, someone will uh, check something. Okay. I think. Um, and I, um, I can't understand anything and I can't get a translation. So, um, uh, and even when I had a translation option, they were only in Portuguese and Russian. There wasn't an English translation option, but now that even that has disappeared from mm. when I went when I became a when I became a a panelist, the the translation option dropped off. So I'm I really don't I can't follow any anything. Peter, it was just an introduction for me and for you. They introduced us. So what? Okay. What Elizabeth did, she introduced us. That's it. They now yes. are going to show the film, the video. Okay. Okay. I understood every word, even though I don't speak Portuguese, but it's a miracle. I did understand. Yes, the, the translation should be there. I, okay, I, I do not, not know why, why it's not I just don't have available. the option. Let me, let me see, but um, no, 
I don't, I, that, the translation option dropped off my screen. You don't need it, Peter, it's okay. Okay, all right. Please, please Sandra, uh, can you check where is the, the video of Professor Peter? Yeah, I have one on my, I can show it off of this computer. Yeah, let's not waste time on that. That's the, that we don't need translation. Uh, oi, então é o vídeo que o professor pediu, né? Eu peço isso para o suporte da Softaliza e a gente está com um problema com a tradução também. É, estamos buscando resolver isso. Só mais um Poxa. minutinho. Nossa, então eles, eles não compreenderam a minha fala, né? Eu penso a demora que... foi tão grande. Eu penso que o vídeo é, Peter, pode... Peter, Anana, just a minute. I need to, to make a new arrangement with we the translators. It's not really that important. It's technical. It was just an introduction, and then we speak. Right. That's it. We don't need the translation. I understand that, but I think they're trying to queue up the, the video that I created, which I can run off this computer. Let me, but I don't, let me see if I can project it. Um, it it's possible. Just a minute. I think, uh, Anna, I think the problem is they're trying to find whoever... Lu, você, Lu, quer que eu passe o vídeo? Eu Pode tenho ser. aqui. Pode ser, eu mas é que nós estamos sem tradutores agora, não estou entendendo isso. I could go first and then in the meantime you will find uh, the Peter's video. I, I can go first, okay? Elizabeth, yeah. is all okay. right? Okay. Yes. So I'll share my screen and uh, I will begin. Um, let's see if you can see my screen. Right. Yes, here. So first of all, thank you to all for the invitation. Bom dia. Bom dia. Really great to see your colleagues, Luciana, everybody. Thank you so much. Obrigada. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, really pleasure, of course, my memories are fresh from being at um, your university in Santa Catarina in Florianopolis, beautiful place. Thank you so much. Uh, so now not to waste time. So I want to talk about, of course, uh, Freire and Vygotsky celebrating legacies and also moving beyond, beyond them. This is a very critical word here. Uh, Elizabeth, do you need uh, now to step in? Uh, I would ask you if you want me to translate <laughs> uh, so, a, just, just a, a general idea. If there is a transcription there below, then it's okay. Then I'll just continue, right? Okay, so All I right. want to emphasize that I take the view that we need, of course, to celebrate, but we also need to move beyond together with them, but also beyond. Both Freire and Vygotsky were revolutionaries, in many different meanings of this word. They were in the midst of revolution, especially Vygotsky, of course, Freire too, in his own way, each in their own way. And if we want to understand Freire Vygotsky, we need to be revolutionaries too. We cannot be passive observers of uh, what's going on in the world and think that we can work with Freire and Vygotsky. We need to be like, uh, them also revolutionaries. We need to be engaged and gajao with, uh, with the events, the political events in the world and be activists. And from within this active engagement, then understanding, theorizing and research are possible. So I have several points here for you about Vygotsky and Freire. Both are philosophers in the first place. They are beyond the discipline of education or psychology. They have a philosophical deep system of views on human nature and development, on reality and truth, on objectivity and subjectivity, on nature and culture, and other major constructs and ideas. And um, this is what I call ethical onto epistemology. So the system of views about what is, what is reality, what exists, that's ontology, how we get to understand it, that's epistemology, and how this is related to what we want to see happen in the world, 
what we value as uh, our principles, agendas, uh, desires, and this is about ethics. So this philosophy in prayer in Vygotsky is not very easy to understand just because it's ahead of its time. It was ahead of its time when they worked, but it's still not uh, present in the mainstream social sciences and education. Social sciences and education today in the world, the mainstream uh, approaches, they are still mechanistic, non-dialectical, and they are stuck in the 19th century, if you like, where these uh, views, almost Newtonian views, were still prevalent. But we need to work on, on excavating the ontoepistemology and ethics from uh, the philosophy of Vygotsky and Freire. A very difficult task. I've been working on this for some, I don't know, 40 years. And um, of course, I don't say I have all the answers, but I can offer some clues, some steps. And of course, I do it as myself, someone who is very engaged in political matters, because I work at the City University of New York, you can see behind me, which is a very progressive left wing uh, activist university. I work with students who are teachers in Bronx, Harlem, uh, Brooklyn, Staten Island in New York, where they are on the ground of a huge struggle and battle for equality because they work in schools where there is no justice, there is no uh, sufficient resources and children are impoverished and very often uh, in a horrible situation when uh, mm, they, their development and education are oppressed. So New York education, uh, especially uh, for minorities is a system of oppression. So that's what I'm saying, not only alone, I'm saying it together with the vast group of my colleagues and students at the City University of New York, program of urban education, which, mean, which means when we say urban, it means the education for the oppressed, for the poor, for the children who are non-mainstream. So of course, the gods can pray. It. So what is at stake? Of course, it's a, they have a Marxist foundation. That's a Marxist philosophy that they are working with. Not that they just take it mechanically, they develop Marxist <clears throat> principle and, uh, principles and develop their approaches on the Marxist foundation. So to understand Freire Bogotsky, please, you have to read also Marx. Well, sorry, yes, it's not, it does take, it take time. It's a huge work, but there is no other way. It's just impossible. Impossible, okay? Impossible, absolutely. Okay, so because otherwise also, if we don't take philosophy, we break Vygotsky and Freire into pieces, principles, ideas, but we don't take the core, like the driving cell, if you like, Vygotsky used the expression, the driving notion, what is the core of their approaches? By the way, if you wonder, is there something similar between Freire and Vygotsky? You don't have to look far, very far, other than to see that they're both under attack right now. Bolsonaro, of course, I don't have to tell you, you know it. Uh, there is an attack on Freire, absolutely. And in the US, there is an attack on critical race theory and the Marxist educators. Today, you can open New York Times. Okay, not today, yesterday, but yesterday, Google, New York Times, critical race theory. They talk about how this theory is under attack. It's everywhere in the news, everywhere. It's really a huge part of what happened during the elections because there is a horrible attack on <clears throat> critical race theory and Marxist educators because they are very closely connected, even if it's not explicated always. So, right, there we go. So what is special about Marxism? Okay, not as a dogma. I'm sorry, not as a dogma. So, so we, we, we're talking about taking the gist, the, the, uh, the gist of this approach. So, so first of all, it's the theory and practice together in a unique blend. And it's a uh, theory and practice together that are organized with certain society in view, certain principles, ethics in view. Of course, the society that is anti-racist, non-hegemonical, and non-hierarchical. 
that's at the core of both Vygotsky and Freire. This ideal, or if you, some people use the notion utopia, of a society that they want to see in this world. They're not saying that we are in that world. Vygotsky too was, of course, not in an ideal situation, absolutely. And I know Peter will address that. Yes, there were issues there, but they had the vision. They had the vision, just like Marx, that there can be a free and just society for all, where children will all be, and human beings will all be valued the same way, with dignity, with respect and freedom, and where they will be able to be free. So this is a, developed from a unique position of this society in view, socialism, communism, you can use different words. In the US now, people are not afraid of these words anymore. The young generation prefer socialism above capitalism in the US now. Among young people, please Google this. <clears throat> Peter, I'm all spelling this to you. Please Google, young people prefer socialism over capitalism in the United States of America. So. Uh, this is social political address, of course. So they're writing and doing this work, Freire and Bogotsky, both for, um, for the uh, society that is free. However uh, far it is still from us, but we're working for it. That's the principle. There is a commitment and there is work. It doesn't mean there is a absolute ideal already established. No, it, it will change every step of the way, by the way. It doesn't have to be fixed. It's like a horizon. Horizon, when you walk, you see a horizon. You need to see it to know where you are and where you want to go. But the horizon will shift every step of the way. Where you go, the horizon will shift. It will change along the way. So there is no fixed, absolutely <clears throat> set in stone ideal, but there is a commitment to freedom, equality, dignity, and uh, anti-racism is very important. So uh, this is about um, finding out what we see as important for us. In critical race theory, this is now being discussed. I think there is more and more emphasis that scholars need to critique current situations. Some people say that's a quote, scholars may need to critique. I say we need to critique uh, current situation to be able to see the horizon and to know. Knowledge is intricately related to the orientation where we want to go. There is no knowledge floating from no, in the abstract when we don't know who we are, where we are, and where we want to go. To know something is to know where you want to get. That's a very... Di uh, fine dialectic, but it's at the core of understanding <clears throat> Marxism, Vygotsky, and Freire. So we need to diagnose what's going on. So uh, this is actually, I'll just uh, quote one beautiful passage from Augusto Boal. I, I'm sure in Brazil people know him very well, but um, in one of his last speeches before actually, unfortunately, he passed away, he was talking after the crisis of 2008, and he was talking about <laughs> how there was this illusion of a safe world despite wars, genocide, slaughter, and torture. Because many in the elites among educators too thought as if it was far away in the wild, remote, wild places. And then he's saying, we who were living in the security, we're told that everything was just bad theater, a dark plot in which few people won and a lot many people lost. So, and we were spectators in the last row of balcony. So he was talking about the crisis of capitalism. That's what we have today. Capitalism is doing no less than killing the planet. That's one of the um, uh, articles I just shared with uh, some of my colleagues. This is from the Guardian. You can Google capitalism is killing the planet and all of us together. So from this position, we need to keep it in mind to understand Vygotsky and Freire. Are they? fighting for a socialist society? Is it something we can align with? Yes, we have to. I think we need to and we must. If we want to understand Freire and Vygotsky and work with them, we have to take an anti-capitalist position. If we don't, okay, it's up to you, but don't then engage Vygotsky and Freire because that's not your then uh, you know business, <laughs> I would say. I mean, that's where it's pretty radical, but yes, I, I am favoring a very radical position of understanding Vygotsky and Freire 
from a socialist commitment to a different world beyond capitalism. It's it's now uh, something that I discuss with students. And if you think I'm radical, please come to New York to Graduate Center and talk to my students. You will see that, the, <laughs> that they are as radical as it gets because they work in schools in Bronx and Brooklyn and uh, mm, all other boroughs in Manhattan. Okay, can we use Vygotsky and Freire? Maybe they're master's tools. Audre Lorde warned us about uh, not using the tools from the patri patriarchy. They are both white men. Uh, of course, Freire, you can argue, of course, he's not uh, European, but nonetheless, he's using Marx. So this is European foundation. Should we be wary about that? Um, we, we need to be, of course, wary, but I would say both Freire and Vygotsky need to be understood as being in the radical strand of critical thinking, part of scholarship of resistance, resisting, the uh, traditions of European canons. So they emerged from European tradition, but they went against its very core postulates with Marx, because Marx also turned things upside down. He literally turned Hegel on uh, his feet away from him being on his head. So there is an overhaul of all major assumptions of Eurocentric science in solidarity with the oppressed and for ideals of social justice and equality, both of them. Okay, few quotes, beautiful, Freire, my voice is in tune with a different language, another kind of music. Oh, it's probably much better in Portuguese. It speaks of resistance, indignation, the just anger of those who are deceived and betrayed. You know these words and his language is so poetic and wonderful even in English. As to Vygotsky, we see the same. It's a passionate quest for equality and justice contra and against Western domestication of Vygotsky, as we see in the major interpretations of Vygotsky. I am sorry, I have to tell you this. Yes, but especially in his works on disability, he, he challenges absolutely the deficit-based views and uh, he works and writes, this is a quote, he writes that we need to commit to a better future along with the liberation of the many millions of human beings from oppression and there will come the liberation of the human personality from its fetters of capitalism. That's a quote from Vygotsky. I'll give you uh, uh, references if you like. A stage, he writes also, a stage on unprecedented, extremely intense degeneration of bourgeois science. Bourgeois means capitalist science, that's what Vygotsky writes. In the perverted world of fascist psychology, he calls it fascist psychology. Race and blood, blood and race underpins everything in the world. This is about the cynical, extremely dangerous, directly racist views. Vygotsky is seeing what's going on in all of bourgeois science of his time, and it happens still today. So we can see these things continue. <laughs> So he did criticize the negative approach to studying, for example, cultural minorities, and he really spoke up against the colonial idea of primitive men. He, uh, his language is not always perfect. There are ways to critique, yes, absolutely, but we need to see the core. So he criticized those who compared students from minority cultures uh, uh, when people, researchers look for what students lack in comparison to so-called civilized child. So for Vygotsky, this was a colonial idea. Very important to note. Okay, and Vygotsky takes a dialectical approach to tradition. He says we must, of course, be in connection with the past, even when we deny it, we rely upon it. It's a dialectical, we do not throw away the tradition, but we overcome it, we go beyond it. And he says, we accept the name of our science, meaning psychology, with all its age old delusions as a reminder of our victory over these errors as the fighting scars of wounds, as a vivid testimony of the truth which develops in the incredibly complicated struggle. That's how, how he's saying himself. He is struggling with a fascist bourgeois psychology to develop a new approach uh, and uh, to present the scars, fighting scars of the wounds. In that struggle, he's writing about himself uh, also. So, of course, their approach is away from assumptions of individualism, passivity, neutrality, and that adaptation to the status quo against and away from Cartesian splits of mind and body thought and action, nature and culture, and person versus the world. These are the key 
lines of thinking that they both develop to overcome the flaws, the uh, flaws and faults of bourgeois sla uh, slash capitalist psychology. They are in stark opposition to it and they speak up against it. So let's see. For Freire, of course, the main topic is humanizing education. And he talks about rehumanization as humanizing through humanizing pedagogy. Of course, that really goes without saying. That really goes without saying. Equality and justice for the oppressed. Uh, in Vygotsky, it's more difficult to see and people don't see what's his, his revolutionary like um, gist. Well, it's the idea that all children, with no exception, have the same potential for development without any assumptions of any natural limits imposed of them. And uh, it's uh, the remnant of racist legacy, colonialist legacy, to think that people, people and children or students are endowed in different way with some natural, natural traits or anything from birth. Nothing like that works from Vygotskian point of view and his six volumes of his works. Uh, by the way, there, is, there shouldn't be any doubt that these are his works and they are edited by his close friends, really friends and family. So please trust the, the works in six volumes. There are no problems there except for minor issues of translation, but this always exists. There is no perfect translation of anybody from Shakespeare to whoever you want to uh, have uh, Hegel, Marx. Of course, there are always problems with translations, but they are not that significant that you cannot see. If you look, if you look from a commitment, then you see what you need to see. So, and both, of course, are about education and research being political through and through. How is it possible? Okay, let's see, uh, just to point, uh, pause here for a second, in Vygotsky, it's very important that he dispels or throws away the mythology of innate traits as linked with rigid social stratification and control. Uh, because uh, his approach, of course, in, in line with contemporary breakthroughs in biological science, in epigenetics, in dynamic system theory, that's where contemporary science is beginning to move from Richard Lewontian to Gould, to contemporary workers such as uh, Likli, Tahanikat, I've written, I've written about this, of course, uh, in many, many works, but this is where we see the breakthroughs along with Otskin's approach also. So here we're talking about this transformative onto epistemology that is at the core of both Freire and Vygotsky, maybe in incipient form. So I'm pushing for it, but of course, in moving beyond also Freire and Vygotsky. But what are the elements there? Not elements, but core pieces for the, or layers. The pieces are not good because that's mechanical, layers in their approach. First of all, uh, both of them put social practice at the center. At the center. And if you hear this, you might think, okay, social practice at the center, all right, but that's not what, what it is. It is the turning around of everything you think you know about human development and psychology, because uh, it's a very radical shift and very radical reconstruction of everything about human development. So there is, of course, the notion of practice and the Freire uses reality as process and transformation rather than as a static entity. It's a process. Oh my, yeah, I, I wish I could explain it with like or talk about this in more and more detail, but trust me, this is like a paradigmatic shift that leaves no stone untouched in the theory of human development from a psychology point of view, which of course is very important here. So the same for Vygotsky. And he talks about reality as it is encountered, encountered in practice, right there at the bottom, in thinking and speech. So it is the notion of, of uh, reality as practice, as something that people engage in. The second layer is that the issue of co-belonging, that there is no gap between uh, the person and the world and the person and another person. And again, it cannot be taken in a very shallow way of like, oh, then the, we need to also see that children interact. It's not about that. It's about how we're composed of a relationship of social bond, bonds that form the very nature of human development. So uh, Freire here and Vygotsky are in unison. Freire speaks of indivisible solidarity between the world 
and human beings, okay, admitting of no dichotomy between them. How about that? Just take this point and think it through. That's one of the radical points for the philosophy that they are both developing. Vygotsky pretty much says the same thing. The child from the very first days participates in the social life of the home to which he belongs. And not just participates, and by the way, participates as he also develops. No, the participation is all there is. There is no additional development of natural traits or biological foundation. No, participation takes over biology and develops it into its own realm of uh, human development, which is unique and not reducible to anything you might think you can reduce it to. It's not. Okay, so then the social belonging uh, against the individualism and solipsism. So Vygotsky, of course, that's his core staple. He talks about social constitution of mind. Through others, we become ourselves. Yes, there will be other thoughts like that later on by Levinas and others, Bakhtin, along with Vygotsky. Yes, but in Vygotsky, that's very clear. Read his works on infancy. In, in Freire's perspectives, it's the same. Our being is being with. Uh, I interpret these notions as um, basically telling us there is no such a thing as a child. There isn't. There isn't a child, for goodness sake. There is no such a thing as an individual. There isn't. You cannot study the child. That you cannot, we cannot study the individual. We just cannot. If we take Vygotsky and Freire and their core assumptions there, we have to study something else completely. Well, there is also the notion of reciprocity between teaching and learning. This is an absolutely original view in both Freire and Vygotsky. Freire writes about all educational practice requiring the existence of subjects who while teaching learn and who in learning also teach. Vygotsky, of course, talks about teaching learning as one process, Obuchenia, there have been hundreds of works about that, and yet they only scratch the surface. Again, I mean, I think my main passion today is just to let you know that all of this can be really, uh, you know, for all of us, looked into at a deeper layer, deeper level, and really taken with a more radical twist or maybe gist. Okay, so I take their notions about teaching and learning as one process, as not this, this, um, mundane idea that, oh yeah, you teach, you also learn. Oh yes, if you learn, you also teach. That's not like that. It's a radical overhaul of all of pedagogy, completely putting it from its head, which it is now on to its feet, the way it should be. And this pedagogy is about that we need to stop teaching. We really need to stop teaching. I just did two podcasts, they will be soon available about how we need to stop teaching because teaching does not work from the position of both Freire and Vygotsky. We need to stop just doing this as a sole activity, as if you can give some knowledge to others, as if you can transmit it to others, to students, for example, and as if you are transmitting some truth. No, all of science is not about truth. It's about the process of getting to know. It's a process of constantly making mistakes. All of science is about making mistakes. Read Einstein about that. And of course, uh, scholars, uh, deep scholars know about this and write about this. So that's another topic that could be expanded here, but definitely it's not about imparting any knowledge and uh, that has been written about, but it has to be taken in a very, very radical stance. That's why I am just really putting it in red. That's my expression of what I think Freire and uh, Vygotsky are about. It's about the need to stop teaching. It needs, we need to learn from our students and, and only teach in the process of learning as one process. And how it becomes one process is uh, a very, uh, complicated but very important conversation we all need to have, I think. I don't have all the answers again. I'm not giving all the answers. I'm just indicating where we need to radicalize both Freire and Dubotsky and to stop domesticating them and stop taking them in a shallow, non-philosophical, absolutely mm, you know, uh, uh, way that is incompatible with their works. 
as I see the things. But of course, others can argue. I'm not against argument. <clears throat> so stop teaching is, a, uh, is something extremely important. Now, also, we cannot pass by the notion that education is political through and through, both Freire and Vygotsky. I started in the beginning with that. I'm now saying it again. And of course, Freire says that his approach demands of educators a clear ethical and political commitment to transforming oppressive social conditions. And nothing works without that. It just doesn't work. And guess what? Vygotsky says the same. Vygotsky says the same. Pure objectivity in the educator is utter nonsense, utter nonsense. Education must not and cannot be politically indifferent. There we go. There we go. How about we see teachers now uh, too shy to say what they believe in? That's the last thing we want to see in educators from my point of view. Okay, so I will not go into too many details uh, with uh, what I call amputated version of human beings that is present in still in dominant versions of psychology and um, pedagogy today in the United States and mainstream of course views all over the world, unfortunately, uh, but it's about, I will just briefly say, solo individuals developing in a vacuum, mind in the head, knowledge as collection of facts, and pedagogy is about passing knowledge. But these are not separate points. All They all have to do with uh, ethical and epistemology based on principles of active engagement and transformation. So where I, I suggest to push for more, because so far what I showed you was a, was a take on Freire and Vygotsky now, of course, uh, seeing their philosophical foundations, their political commitments now, where do we need to push for more? I think we need to see, as Freire has said too, we need to see human beings as subjects rather than objects of history, as co-creators of history and society, my, in my language, a little bit slightly adding to Freire, and uh, we need to talk about the urgency of agency. That's the key words for many of my works, where I talk about the importance of seeing people not as passive recipients of the world, which is outside of them, and they are just there to observe and maybe think about things. No, it's about active engagement again with agentive agenda, uh, active agenda, and uh, orientation to change things. Of course, by the way, here, this is a, a refrain from very famous Marxist postulate that philosophers have traditionally tried to explain the world. The point is to change it. Well, everybody knows this sentence. I assume everybody who has read Marx at least a little bit would know that this is one of the most famous quotes. We, sh we cannot just explain the world. We need to change the world. Unfortunately, I've written about this. This is understood as if, as always, understood outside of radical philosophy is understood as if, okay, so you change the world, plus you then also understand maybe along the way, maybe after you change, maybe at the same time. No, that's not the idea. The idea is that changing the world is the process of knowing the world. There is no gap between changing the world and knowing it. You cannot know outside of actively, agentively changing the world. There is no way for knowledge that is not, of course, uh, just, you know, abstract and formal and that is dead. To have knowledge that is actionable, living knowledge that can work, it has to come out from the process of changing the world. That's the notion of educators being political agents, co-creators of realities together with their students, not imposing this on students because that's where the difficulty begins. And people say, oh, that's the like the communist propaganda, then that's what you want. No, because that's where both Freire and Vygotsky need to be added and, and Vygotsky has it in his works on play, the notion that it's up to each person to decide what they want to do. Up to each person to deliberate of what is their agenda and point of view. But this each person doesn't mean solo individual. It means each person as member of community. 
So we just need to shift away from the notion of individual to the notion of community members. So people as members of their communities who see the fight of their communities and the struggle and the suffering of their communities. These individuals, uh, they are still deciding for themselves. Nobody can put it up on top of them and beat them with a stick to believe in the same thing. No. But how this notion of activism and political stance is compatible with freedom, freedom and self-determination. Well, it's a, a, some the topic that I have written at length about, including in my book. That's why this book is 500 pages, because these things require a very lengthy explanation so that we are not stuck in the old 19th century views of what is freedom, what is individual, what is self-determination, and who is Vygotsky and Prede. Let's take them to the 21st century. It's not easy, but it's possible. I don't give all the final answers, but I am suggesting a path that I think can work, and I've seen it work. Okay, there is the transformative activist stance. I have, don't know if I have still much time, Mm, someone will need to tell me by text, for example, uh, if I'm uh, beyond my time. But very quickly, this is the, my work, which builds on Freire and Vygotsky. It's called the Transformative Activist Stance. Just Google this expression, and you will see that I'm talking about reality as a lived struggle on the ground, an arena of human historical praxis, taking this from Marx, but also through Freire Vygotsky and critical race theory and feminist Chicana epistemology and philosophy of resistance and feminist works, amazing works in the US. So of course I give credit to many things in the US that are just amazing philosophers and scholars here, but also in the global South as well, such as Gloria Anzaldúa and Audre Lorde. And these are works that I use and learn from constantly daily on a daily basis. So then uh, the process of knowing is a contingent on contributions to collaborative practice. And that's what I just was explaining about how, how we can only know from the process of changing. Okay, and this is relying to now positioning ourselves. And um, yes, I see I have uh, five minutes. Yes, and this is about also the transformative nature of collaborative practice. By the way, I do draw on work such as by Barbara Rogoff, by Ethel Tobak, by Sylvia Scribner, by Jerome Brunner and others. There are wonderful works. Uh, I just don't agree with everything that they have. I think they need also still to, pu to be pushed and that's fine. I, I'm sure my works also need to be taken with the same critical view and also pushed for more. So, but uh, you, I can uh, show you, of course, in the book, I dialogue with all of this tradition that has been so important in the United States, especially Barbara Rogoff, especially Sylvia Scribner. I personally also like uh, works of Ethel Tobak. They are extremely important. Also works by Jerome Brunner and others by Stephen Toulmin, by the way, if you look Look at uh, the review of Vygotsky by Stephen Toulmin, who called him Mozart of psychology. I mean, that's still one of the best reviews of Vygotsky on three pages. He says more than, than maybe decades of writing uh, than that happened later on. Well, because he was a philo he was a genius philosopher. Stephen Toulmin himself. Uh, he specialized in Wittgenstein, but you had just a very solid philosophical foundation, which is a sine qua non, is a condition to understand Vygotsky. First, 30 volumes of Marx, then six volumes of Vygotsky. I'm kidding a little bit, okay? But Marx is 30 volumes, by the way. Maybe it's even 40, okay? I'm kidding a little bit, but you know what I'm trying to say, that it has to be a philosophical understanding. All right, so then uh, for me, the critical point is this notion of in individually unique contributions to collaborative practices, because the notion of contribution closes the gap between the individual and the social. Contribution is both individual and social at once, okay? At once. So uh, I'm talking about uh, people co-authoring, co-realizing the world and bringing ethical dimensions to the very fabric of what is real and objective. What is objective is absolutely infused with values, okay? Objectivity is at one with subjectivity, there is no gap. So at the core of my work is also the notion that every person matters. 
So I'm not prepared to lose the dignity of each and every individual person as member of community. So again, closing the gap between what is individual, what is social, let's not be at the 19th century level there. So we need to look at ourselves and our students as social historical actors, as Freire was saying, and Vygotsky invited us to do. This is just quickly the book where this is described, The Transformative Mind. The title is taken from, of course, the mind and society work. Um, yes, and um, right. Uh, this uh, I'm very happy to share that my work has been translated into Portuguese, just came out, thanks to Professor Maynardes uh, in Brazil, and uh, maybe more works will come, but this is, for example, just came out 2021, Alteridade Etica na Pesquisa, okay? What? Oh, that's in the introduction, sorry. Etico Antropistimologia Ativista. Pesquisa Estudo de Resistencia. I have no idea if I'm saying it right. I speak French, German, Russian, and English, not Portuguese. So maybe I'm. Professor Ana, quer que eu leia para você os títulos? Sorry, say it again. Uh, uh, do you want me to read for you the titles? Yes, please read the title, please. Okay. Compromisso e Posicionamento, Ética em Pesquisa Ativista Transformadora, do Eduardo Viana e da Ana Estetsenko. Yes, and the first one, Ético Onto. Yes. É, ético Onto Epistemologia Ativista, Pesquisa e Estudo de Resistência, da Ana Estetsenko. This is so beautiful. Portuguese is so beautiful. I will learn it, I promise. I started uh, just recently. You okay? should. So, Thank yes, you. If you are interested, please uh, take a look there. And of course, you can Google. You can also write to me. In the people in the audience, please. And I'm prepared to be critiqued and learn from you because you are activists on the ground. Brazil is at the center of the struggle. Okay? Politically. That's why the best scholarship has to come from Brazil. I said it many times, I'm glad to tell you again, you are positioned to make the best breakthrough and Prairie did it and you can do it. We can do it together, but I invite you to be activists and to do scholarship from a political agenda of revolutionary change. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for this great talk, Professor Anna. Thank you. I'm so grateful to all of you for listening. Grateful to uh, the translators. Thank you, the dear translators. I'm so indebted to you. Thank you. It, it, Obrigada. It's very, it's very inspiring for us. Thank Obrigada. you. Obrigada. You are the best. Brazil. I love Brazil. Hasta la revolución. Okay? Okay. Please love you come all. here. Come here to I will. Talk to I us. will. No doubt. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Well, uh, Agora nós teremos um vídeo do professor Peter que ele mandou para nós, que será apresentado e os tradutores farão aí o trabalho de tradução do vídeo. Então, quem for da, do suporte, por favor, pode colocar o vídeo do professor Peter. Professor Peter, your video will begin in, in some minutes. Um, and Elizabeth, I can. I think I can run it off my computer if I need to. Okay. Uh, let me, let me uh, do because I, don't I think that. someone will run it. Uh, uh, let's wait if it's okay. okay. Give it a it's few working. minutes. Um, I can do it. Here we go. I, I think it's beginning. Thank you. Hello, my name is Peter Smagorinsky. Uh, I am recently retired from the University of Georgia here in the United States, and I'm very, very honored to be on part of this program. Um, I'd like to thank, of course, the organizers, my, my new Brazilian colleagues, and I really look forward to talking this over with uh, Ana Stetsenko, um, who's, uh, who's, whom, whom I'll refer to later as one of the influences on part of my thinking here. I'd also like to thank in advance uh, Mariana Sato Manning, my Brazilian friend and colleague, uh, who, who really is my um, primary source of information on uh, Freire. Uh, as I'll say shortly, I'm, I'm better at Vygotsky than Freire, but I, I hope that what I do know uh, has some value in this discussion. 
So um, Anna and I have been asked to talk about two visionary scholars and educators, uh, Paul Freire and Lev Vygotsky. Each has made important contributions to social and educational theory, grounded in a Marxist framework. The shared theoretical foundation suggests that their visions of society would be very similar, but the more I read them, the more different they seem to me. In large part, as sociocultural theory might predict, their very different social environments and histories produced different contexts for their work. Although each derived his ideas from the views of Karl Marx, they incorporated Marxist principles into different social, social cultural, and disciplinary frameworks, emerging from their societies in which they grew up and the educational problems each faced. In this talk, my task is to investigate how these different settings took their Marxist understandings in different directions. So here I'll acknowledge uh, that I'm much better versed in Vygotsky's writing than Freire's. Actually, I've never read either one because neither one wrote in English. As a result, I rely on translations. Many who've looked into the matter of translating Vygotsky into English say with great certainty that the translations are flawed. First, Vygotsky's writing was not often not written by Vygotsky. Rather, some texts ascribed to him were derived from lecture notes taken by his students. And this dependence undoubtedly has produced problems with reliability. Others were dictated to stenographers from his sickbed, a place he occupied for many years of his short life. As a result, his prose lacked the sharpness available from meticulously composed written texts and can cycle through ideas in a repetitive manner. Further, these texts were largely suppressed when toward the end of his life, the Soviet pedology dec decree banned much of his writing along with the ideas that drove his educational approach. When they did become available, they were edited by Communist Party members who adjusted them to make them more consistent with the official version of Marxism endorsed by the state. This version pro provided the basis for everything translated into English and has been described by a new translation project as odious and scandalous in their infelicities. And yet this is what I rely on. Finally, they were translated by a variety of people into English versions that can be very inconsistent with one another. The three translations of thought and language or thinking and speech, which is a better translation, illustrate these differences well. Such authorities as Rene Vanderveer have argued that there is no excellent translation of this text, which is among the essential readings of his career. I interpret then Vygotsky at my own peril, given that I have no access to his original writing. And of course, that problem does not plague uh, Anastan Stetsenko, who, um, to whom I would defer on matters of interpretation. I'm sure I needn't introduce Ferry to a group of Brazilians, but we'll reference his main ideas for the purpose of comparing him to Vygotsky. Ferry has influenced and inspired social justice educators for many decades around the globe. He remains an influential figure in the United States in social justice initiatives. According to a search I ran recently, his scholarship has been referenced over 445,000 times in academic publications. Over 100,000 citations have gone to pedagogy, pedagogy of the oppressed alone. Frey thought to uncover the effects of external social realities and structures on people's lives and help them develop tools for countering inequitable conditions. Vygotsky has been referenced about 250,000 times in published scholarship, though the manner in which he is referenced suggests to me that most people referencing him have not actually read him, relying instead on secondhand summaries or readings of single chapters in the collection Mind and Society. Vygotsky was not quite the social justice theorist that Freire was. He was concerned with developing a comprehensive understanding of human psychology in terms of the development of a human species, of human communities, and of individuals within those communities. He broke away from two dominant traditions in psychology of the early, early 20th century, and this is a point at which psychology was a very new um, and emerging science. Behaviorism and, refle and reflexology, he asserted, studied a body without a mind, focusing only on observable physical actions, uh, Pavlov among his, uh, the people he critiqued. Introspective psychologies, in contrast, studied the mind without a body, that is, cognition that takes place in the head 
without attention to emotions, the whole body and the person in cultural historical context. Vygotsky's great achievement was building a psychology that accounted for both nature and nurture, phylogeny and ontogeny, mind and society, biology and social mediation. Remarkably, both behaviorism and in the head cognitive psychology remain dominant conceptions. In autism treatments, for instance, the behaviorism paradigm seeks to modify the behavior through punishments and rewards to normalize an autistic child's conduct. Meanwhile, cognitive psychologists continue to construct laboratory-based models of human cognition that Vygotsky would have considered mechanistic and inattentive to social contexts and thus incapable of capturing the whole human condition. Vygotsky's project was not launched to produce social critique. Vygotsky's critiques were aimed at his contemporaries in psychology and the histories upon which they drew. Critiquing Stalin's social order would not have ended well. That fact is central to the points I hope to make today. There was, there were, you could not be much of a social activist in Stalin's Soviet Union. Let's take a look at their use of Marxism. Both Ferry and Vygotsky foregrounded different aspects of the dialectical relation that people have with their particular circumstances. Ferry was concerned with how people interpret their environments, read their worlds, and can act to change them. Frey's work was focused on using Marxist, Marx's capitalist critiques to help lower, lower social economic class Brazilians develop critical meta-awareness of their environments and seek to change economic structures in order to encourage the leveling of social classes. He seized on the problem of social, econo social economic disparities and sought to elevate those considered oppressed to a better station in life through their own agency. His pedagogy aimed to teach those oppressed by inequitable educational opportunities and income distribution to question their locations in society and ultimately seek to alter personal agency and economic structures in order to live more fulfilling lives. Vygotsky's position as a Soviet psychologist, excuse me, focused his research on studying understanding and explaining the process of how people internalize ways of thinking from their surroundings. He was primarily interested in how people's consciousness is shaped through engagement with social mediation. As a member of the burgeoning communist Soviet empire, he had little need to critique capitalism given that it had been legislated out of existence in his society. And so he had little reason to be concerned with matters of economic disparity and, just, and injustice at least in the Soviet Union. Among his shortcomings to the Communist Party members who dismissed him was his insufficient attention to social class issues, even as he does address them in his writing and from my perspective, quite often. But he didn't do enough for the party. And so to the, toward the end of his life and certainly in the aftermath of his life, Vygotsky was uh, oppressed, suppressed and obliterated by the Soviet uh, authorities. The positions of Frey and Vygotsky produced different career trajectories and emphases. Frey was raised in a middle-class family in Brazil that, like many others, was devastated during the Great Depression beginning in 1929. His experiences with poverty influenced his teaching career. He learned the importance of providing the poor with literacy practices and social tools to construct new futures for themselves. He was thus an educational philosopher whose ideas emerged from his practical experiences with the Brazilian oppressed. His liberatory pedagogy was seen as a threat to the military government, as evidenced by the events which immediately followed the military coup of 1964. Freire's programs were dismantled, he was jailed, and then exiled for over 15 years. During this period of expulsion, Freire continued his work in Chile, the United States, and Africa, bringing global recognition to his ideas. Upon his return to Brazil, he worked in the area of adult literacy and later as Secretary of Edu Education for Sao Paulo. He moved to administrative positions that enabled him to affect pedagogical policy, including his engagement with the practical problem of allevi alleviating poverty and oppression through liberatory pedagogy. He used his position to advance the lives of society's oppressed 
with the oppressed themselves undertaking critiques to identify the source of inequity. This foundational work in critical theory remains a key idea in educational thought in universities. And I would, uh, this is extant not only in the United States, but Mexico, where I uh, have an appointment. Even if it's often difficult to practice this, uh, this liberatory pedagogies in the United States schools where the status quo is fiercely protected by institutional structures and more recently political actions by people who oppose equal access to opportunity, especially when they think it threatens their own security. These tend to be people like me who are white people. Vygotsky came of age during the Bolshevik revolution that produced the formation of the Soviet Union. He was a Jewish man in an anti-Semitic culture that took an official stance of atheism. And prior to that, uh, his whole life um, during the Romanov dynasty was spent in the Pale of Settlement where Jews were banished to. So he grew up amidst anti-Semitism and the Soviet Union, Union in spite of its promise of of um, equality was actually also anti-Semitic, uh, much evidence of that. He still rose through the Soviet psychological ranks on the basis of sheer intellectual brilliance, along with a little luck. Further had the courage and chutzpah, even in his 20s, to challenge the reigning titans of his day, including Ivan Petrovich Pavlov, a Nobel laureate, 57 years his senior, and the, the architect of reflexology. Uh, Vygotsky began his career as a teacher and then became a clinical psychologist. It's somewhat ironic that he developed an art and articulated a sociocultural theory of human development in the relatively isolated context of laboratory studies. In his brief life and career, he worked more as an experimenter and theorist rather than situating his research in the gritty realities of daily life. Although he was never exiled, as uh, Ferry was, he likely would have been had he lived, given how the pedology decree declared shortly before his, that was declared shortly before his death produced a violent backlash against Vygotsky and his cohort. Both Ferry and Vygotsky then began as teachers and adopted a generally Marxist perspective that emphasized the role of social mediation in teaching and learning. Ferry employed this focus to advocate for changes in consciousness that produced intellectual and social tools to promote changes in individual beliefs, practices, and projected life trajectories. Frey's career project thus concerned using a Marxist framework to help people acquire and develop tools and strategies to change their circumstances, to dismantle the inequities that capitalism produces and work toward a society in which social class is eliminated altogether. Marx's communist workers' paradise redistributed power across all people, and if anything, championed the proletariat over the bourgeois. Freire resonated with that goal. He affirmed that the literacy process involves not only reading wor words, but social worlds and their intricacies within the context of socioculturally and historically shaped structures. Literacy was conceptualized by Freire as a vital instrument to change one's position in society as a way to reclaim control of one's life, to engage in transformation and promote social justice. To Vygotsky, in contrast, literacy was a key developmental tool, ideally applied toward the development of con communistic concepts. So literacy more as a broadly applied mediational means than a specific liberatory tool. In Ferrari's notion of critical consciousness, people look at their history and the social construction of their realities. They seek to problematize and separate personal beliefs from institutional discourses. Through dialogue, histories are considered, present realities and conditions are deconstructed, and futures are collectively envisioned. Vygotsky was less of an active activist and more of a descriptive psychologist. He aimed to account for how people learn rather than to change the circumstances and thus the quality of their lives although he did suggest ways in which concepts could be taught more effectively in the context of school. These concepts, however, were not oriented to overthrowing the social order. The communist society itself would take care of overturning the disparities of the Romanov dynasty and capitalism and eliminating social class from the structure of national life. 
The goals Freire thought sought, excuse me, the goals that Freire sought were thus built into the design of Soviet society, at least in their its ideal form, one that in the hands of Stalin produced a different form of oppression and discrimination from the ones that they inherited from the Romanovs, or that they that they got rid of in overthrowing the Romanovs. Both Vygotsky and Freire found roles for the individual within a Marxist perspective, an orientation that likely would have ultimate sent, ultimately sent Vygotsky to the gulag had he survived his, his deadly illness. Some have conflated Freire's social activism with Vygotsky's cultural psychology, but their work is quite different in key ways. The context of the careers, of their careers situated within different cultural milieus shaped the possibilities of each. Vygotsky was in many ways an orthodox Marxist, embedding critiques of European and American capitalism in his outline of human development. He firmly believed Marx's claim that in the, in the history of the evolution of the human species, capitalism would be left behind as the world embraced communism, with the Soviet Union leading this inevitable Darwinian development. It's useful to note that his orientation to Darwin took into account both individual and collective development, like his psychology in general. One of the insights I picked up from Anna Stetsenko is that what is called social Darwinism is typically an individualistic conception with survival of the fittest referring to how individual people gain power over one another through their superior attributes. However, to both Darwin and Vygotsky, what enabled humans to evolve was not entirely due to their intelligence, which is typically thought to matter more than the factors that would predict the species to die out. People are generally physically weak, slow, we don't have a good fur coat, and we have other physical shortcomings, uh, dull teeth, that would, that would mitigate our chances of survival. However, their ability to work collectively for survival was a major factor, factor in their endurance in conjunction with the ways in which certain advantages, particularly the development of speech, enabled people to plan and carry out actions that exceeded the immediate sensory field that surrounded them. And a, a lot of Vygotsky's writing is about the difference between people and animals, which was a task of early psychology. And this ability to see beyond the immediate, hear beyond the immediate, to sense beyond the immediate is a major distinction of between people and animals. And the, um, the this capability largely enabled by uh, the use of speech and inner speech to control, to uh, regulate behavior and to imagine possibilities beyond what you could see in front of you. Darwin and Marx were major, major intellectual sources influencing the formation of the Soviet Union and influencing the content and direction of Soviet psychology. Vygotsky accepted the goal of building a society without social class distinctions. He did not anticipate how the Soviet Union would devolve into totalitarianism, with millions of deaths required to accelerate the evolution of society toward the new Soviet man one who has evolved into an advanced species devoted to the cause of eliminating social class differences. Vygotsky participated in the Soviet effort to impose homogeneity according to Soviet notions of equality. Loria's study of illiterate peasants in remote villages of Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzia, I may have pronounced that wrong, which Vygotsky helped to plan produced the insight that Muslims were a backwards people limited by their isolation in remote communities with little outside contact. Uh, and, and I say that somewhat ironically, it's, I, I don't think that Muslims are backward people. The Soviet national goals included taking the many and varied countries that were being assimilated into their emerging Russian-based culture I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and elevating them to the height of Soviet oh, beliefs. Sorry. Vygotsky and Luria did not share Freire's agenda of empowering these remote presence to you? rebel against Soviet, Soviet intervention into their lives and construct liberated social futures for themselves. 
Crossing Stalin was more likely to result in execution or banishment to a labor camp than to produce a critical consciousness. Vygotsky postulated that people's frameworks for thinking are internalized through social practice derived from cultural history. Communist society itself would provide a new context designed to promote a communist ideology among Soviet citizens, cleansed of dissent through forcible means. Those 10 million people who perished under Stalin. The party leaders in Moscow would establish the nation's societal destination and meanings for achieving it. Ferrari, in contrast, worked at the level of the awakened common person, one with a critical consciousness primed to critique power inequities and work towards social change. He encouraged leaders to bring their culture and personal knowledge into the classroom, help them understand the connections between their own lives and society. That was a quote from a source. Through such transformations in consciousness, each person would be empowered to engage in challenging their realities and collectively negotiating context-specific ways for taking actions to, take, to change their conditions. Vygotsky recognized the reciprocal relationship between people and their cultures in that he saw people having agency to affect their environments, even as they inevitably internalized the, the structures, goals, and practices of those environments. He foregrounded, however, the process of internalization, of taking on the ideology of the established culture and becoming a valued, productive member of the social collective. Ferry, in contrast, foregrounded the other end of the process, externalization, in which people acquire tools in order to work on and alter their environments to create new settings, social destinations, social destinations, personal and group trajectories and means for producing them. And this all in the name of, of, of a raised critical consciousness and liberatory lives. These contrasting but complementary emphases are indicative of another key difference between the two through their focus on different life phases in human development. Vygotsky was a developmental psychologist who sought to understand how children develop higher mental functions, the culturally specific ways of thinking that enable them to function within a society. Those were what he called higher mental functions. His clinical research focused on young children primarily, although he also studied what he called the transi transitional age of adolescence. He was attentive to both biology and social mediation, integrating them in a developmental perspective whereby certain age milestones produce both physical changes, such as the emergence of permanent teeth, the activity of the pineal gland, and the onset of, pu of puberty, and other, uh, other physical changes in human development that were coincidental with, uh, with mental changes. Um, so these, these, uh, these physical changes um, occurred at points at which capabilities and dispositions also emerged. In that sense, he accepted certain biological developmental changes identified by his contemporary Piaget, with whom he is often contrasted. The differences come in how contexts shape those biological developments and how they're realized in the human psyche, tying development not only to advances in age, but the ways in which those changes emerge in a social collective and its ideology, practices, tools, sign attributions, and other internalized ways of assigning meaning to the world. Ferry, in contrast, specialized in adult literacy and liberatory education. He was interested in teaching adults to critique their socio-historical locations and positions and take new action to change them. His notion of critical meta-awareness focused on helping adults to develop a complex understanding of the world and its social and political contradictions so as to provide them with tools with which to act against oppressive circumstances. Frey was less interested in the processes through which young children internalize the values of their societal surroundings. Nevertheless, his approach of cultural circles offers fertile ground for social justice in early educational settings. And that's from um, uh, Mariana Sauto Manning. All in all, Ferry sought to 
foster critical consciousness so that oppression becomes exposed and adults develop strategies for diminishing it. Together, their substantial differences aside, the work of Vygotsky and Ferrari account for the cyclical processes of social mediation through engagement with life settings, the internalization of a worldview based on the use of cultural mediational tools such as speech, and individual and group efforts to recreate that setting through a raised consciousness of life's possibilities, even if such a vision runs counter to the prevailing dominant culture. Even with this complementarity, Ferry's critical pedagogy was not available to Vygotsky in the context of Stalinist Soviet Union, in which dissent was met with swift and brutal reprisal. In sight of the seemingly pro prohibitive limitation of Vygotsky's work, his mediational framework enables some possibilities for being joined with Ferrari's Marxist capitalist critique to inform the work of educators taking a social justice perspective. Given that Ferrari's career was dedicated to liberatory pedagogy and social justice education, applying his ideas to education is relatively straightforward and requires little interpretation. Vygotsky as a clinical psych psychologist whose emphasis focused on so socioculturally mediated human development and whose research was conducted with young children requires greater extrapolation, especially to issues of social justice that were not part of his research program. Vygotsky was a pedologist, not a pedagogue. That is, his work in education concerned broad developmental arcs more than classroom practice no matter often, no matter how often his brief attention to the zone of proximal de development is tied to Jerome Bruner's metaphor of, metaphor of scaffolding, which I've argued is a misunderstanding of a developmental concept that has con been converted into a short-term teaching method. Interestingly, even as many people reference Vygotsky to support scaffolding, which he didn't refer to, and thus represent him as a pedagogue, he wrote that the most important factor in education is the organization of the whole school. With individual classrooms being far less of an influence in how and what students learn, Freire was more a pedagogue than a pedologist concerned with how adults learn to advocate for their own liberation from oppressive structures. Their work does overlap in some areas, at least by inference. Both were interested in the ways in which social institutions provide mediational means that establish the basic framework for human development, and the ways in which higher mental functions enable the self-regulation and agency to act on one's environment. To Ferry, societal inequities fall from the ways in which competitive capitalism establishes class distinctions that are detrimental to the life trajectories of lows at the lower tiers of education and income distribution. Vygotsky's research outlines the ways in which societies establish institutions and their attendant semiotic sign systems, particularly speech, that people appropriate to form the basis of how they conceptualize life in society. Ferry theorized that when people internalize a conception of society, they tend to reinforce its explicit and implicit hierarchical relationships through their activity within its routines and practices. That matches well with Vygotsky's conception of the role that social contexts play, social contexts play in the develop of indiv development of individual consciousness. In contrast, however, Freire's educational vision centered on disrupting, debilitating internalizations of socioculturally and historically construct constructed structures among oppressed people that perpetuate their circumstances over a series of generations. Vygotsky provided empirical documented, documentation of how social values are reflected in individuals assigning of meanings to, meaning to words. He was verbocentric and not a 21st century multiliteracies advocate. He was particularly attentive to the ways in which one's attribution of meaning to words evolves over time to indicate concept development. Uh, I'm, I like to reference uh, Rene Vanderveer's summary of Vygotsky's three main themes, and those three themes are words, words, and words. Um, and so when verbally constructed concepts reinforce social hierarchies, Freire believed 
It's the task of education to provide students with the tools to critique, problematize, and change social structures to provide more equitable access to society, to society's benefits. In contrast, Vygotsky believed that people's senses of self follow from, from being accepted as valued members of the existing social order under the assumption that social communi so Soviet communism was the ideal society, the pinnacle of the Darwinian evolution of the human species. Uh, one of the things I uh, that, that would contradict that is the fact that Russian President Val Vladimir Putin, in the wake of the fall of the Soviet Union, is now perhaps the world's wealthiest person, $250 billion or something like that. So Freire's critical activist interpretation leads to the notion of praxis. And here I'm going to draw again on uh, Mariana Salto Manning's work. Um, and, and she's derived the following sets of assumptions from uh, this notion of praxis. When students arrive in schools or classrooms, they already have knowledge of their own language in everyday worlds. Students are the subject of their own learning along with those education, along with those social worlds. In this kind of educational setting, each student investigates and engages in inquiry, employing problem solving, critical dialogue, and problem solve, problem posing, critical dialogue, and problem solving. Another point is that conflict is the basis for learning. Very, uh, when old knowledge and new knowledge conflict, Participants ask questions, engage in dialogue, critically constructing their own bodies of knowledge. This is similar to the Hegelian thesis, antithesis, synthesis formulation embraced by Vygotsky and it, that it runs throughout his writing. Um, another point being learning takes place collectively rather than in isolation. And finally, culturally relevant pedagogy is not spontaneous. It doesn't just happen. It requires continual inquiry and research. There's much planning, yet the teacher facilitator must know how to critically take advantage of teachable moments and engage students, uh, the, the student participants from multiple backgrounds and communities in meaningful learning experiences. Frey pointed the, to the need to create positive learning environments in which individuals can recognize their oppressions and take active roles, collectively constructing their futures as they consider the histories of their collective and unique contexts. His liberatory pedagogy promotes active involvement and meta-awareness of the transformative process. Individuals must act collectively and must actively and collectively engage in their own struggle for social justice. They need to explore their worlds with examples drawn from their own experiences and themes developed from collective inquiries. Students' lives themselves become a central part of the curriculum with investigations following from what they see as being in need of change. There are many examples of how the social setting of activity invokes norms that may or may not be appropriate for all involved. US schools tend to validate and perpetuate the, value, the values of the Eurocentric middle-class white people, especially in terms of what counts as a sense of propriety in terms of volume diction, occasions, and other aspects of speech. People who violate those norms are often subject to disciplinary actions, even when they were, are following norms that are acceptable in their home communities. Some groups of people talk more and louder than others in, in, uh, in social settings. Often these school norms are so well ingrained in school structure that they are invisible to the point of being beyond question. They're built into what I've called the deep structure of schools, that being the institutionalized curriculum and assessment, and assessment, the dress codes, the codes of conduct, proof speech genres and social languages, conventions for interaction, the composition of the administration and faculty, physical arrangement of schools, the hidden curriculum, and other structural factors that organize the educational process according to a specific value system. So in the United States, 85% of teachers and a, a higher percentage of administrators are white. And the rules that they follow are invisible to them. And the norms that they follow are built into their worldview. 
And so violation and people from other means of socialization appear to be disruptive to them. The deep structure of school tends to have adverse effects on people from outside the group whose culture has provided schools with their values. This phenomenon is, ev phenomenon is evident in the United States and how black and white students are subjected to different, to differently to different disciplinary measures, with black students disciplined far out of proportion to their numbers. From a Vygotskyan perspective, black and white students have internalized different conceptions of what constitutes appropriate behavior in formal social settings. When black students are highly interactive and passionate in class, or when they do not follow routines designed to quiet and regulate their behavior, they often get interpreted as being disruptive and become sub subject to disciplinary action, including suspension from school. From a Frarian perspective, the fact of disproportionate suspension rates would provide the opportunity for critical social awareness designed to produce a just outcome and more equitable approach to discipline in school. Students would inquire into the socio-historical issues shaping such, such oppression while seeking to challenge and redefine what is acceptable in schools and society. This critique could come from an another overlap between Freire and Vygotsky, that being their mutual interest in the ways in which one develops the faculties necessary to reach a state of critical consciousness. Vygotsky asserted that the ability to conceptualize a problem provides one with the tools for regulating one's own thinking about it, consequ consequently leading to action. Education can strive to help young people develop something approaching critical consciousness with attention to the developmental issues that enable increasing levels of abstraction with advances in age and experience. The curriculum would need to be built around equity-based themes related to social justice. These might include discrimination, social responsibility, attention to mental health, uh, an exploration of gender roles, uh, issues of censorship, cultural conflict, immigration, and so on. This routine and systematic engagement with themes related to oppression and inequity could help students develop a concept of social justice that could provide the basis for the sort of praxis that Freire found central to a critical consciousness. Soviet education, in contrast, was designed to produce the new Soviet man, a more specific agenda than the broad goal of creating a society of full, full of critically empowered individuals. Once again, any integration of these two thinkers requires extrapolation, given the different social contexts of their applications. There are substantial differences in emphasis aside, the work of Vygotsky and Freire might be bridged to suggest related possibilities for social justice education. Both felt that theory uninformed by practice is fairly useless even as they propounded theory themselves and believed in the value of abstract thinking. After his youthful work as a teacher, Vygotsky moved his investigations into the laboratory for the most part. He's notoriously difficult to read, and many of us rely on our translations for Vygotsky, as I reviewed earlier. Freire's work has more immediate possibilities for policy. He was a policymaker at the end of his career. He intentionally wrote more excessively and practically with some of his later work being published in dialogue format. As an educational administrator, he understood and concerned with, and was concerned with the work of making policy linking theory and practice. Given that he was an activist for social justice, Freire wrote in order to affect social change. Such a career lends itself more easily to adoption into policy than do reports of experimental psychological research in which Vygotsky, in the sort of uh, experimental psychological research in which Vygotsky specialized, or attention on broad issues of human development, the task of pedology, more than the particulars of instruction, the task of pedagogues. I hope that distinction is clear because I think it's quite important. Pedology, the broad arc of human development within the setting of schools, uh, pedag uh, the pedagogues were more concerned with what goes on in the classrooms. It's interesting to note that although Vygotsky is often invoked to support interactive classrooms, he, like his fellow Soviet theorist M.M. M. Bakhtin, was himself a lecturer. 
at least he, as he comes across in his writing and in accounts of his life. So two people, Bhakti and Vygotsky, typically are, are invoked to support interactive classrooms. From what I can tell, neither one of them actually conducted any. So this has been a story of two Marxists who shared a fundamental view that capitalism produces inequities and that some form of communism would produce an evolutionary change in human societies. Behind this broad consensus, however, are many differences following from their national circumstances, their different interests at different points in human development, childhood and adulthood, and other factors. Integrating their ideas turns out to be more challenging than it might appear based on their broad, on, than they might appear based on broad assumptions about Marxism. I hope that my inquiry into their differences has some value in how people conceptualize the two and make sense of their contributions. And of course, I'm now very much looking forward to um, hearing Anna's talk and seeing what we come up with in the aftermath of both. Thank you. Bem, uh, obrigada, professor. Professor Peter, thank you for your talk. And now uh, we'll have some minutes more, uh, perhaps 20 to 25 minutes of uh, discussion. And I have sent some, some questions to Professor Anna and to Professor Peter already. And then I'd like to ask him, uh, him and her who wants to begin to answer the questions? I, I can begin because, yes, uh, we, we changed turns. So it was me, Peter, now me, then Peter, I guess, right? All right. Uh, that's, not, <laughs> that's not an imposition, right? So, yeah, just a few things uh, to pick up on uh, that yes, I, I saw in comments throughout. I'll, uh, just I'll just translate what I said to you. Uh, pessoal, nós teremos de, de 20 a 25 minutos é, para uma discussão com os professores. E eu já mandei as questões de vocês que colocaram no chat, eu já mandei traduzidas para os dois professores. Eles agora vão responder as questões de vocês, tá bem? Uh -huh. So, first of all, let's not get stuck on translations. It's just there are no perfect translations, but the gods can pray are not like a Bible, ok? Uh, we don't need to follow every word and worry about, oh my goodness, who said that this particular one small word. I mean, I understand. I know there are errors in translation in some places, but really it's not the main issue. We take them creatively, just like they did. Let's do similar uh, work as they did. They didn't go by a canon and by exact wording of Marx. No, it's not about that. It's about taking the gist the major orientation of a struggle and a fight. And that's why I like uh, the question now from Pell. I think Pell, Luciana translated about how, what do we do with this legacy now in our situation of right-wing positions and government? Exactly, that's the point. Let's see, first of all, what's going on and let's really pause and take a political stance and uh, that's a very important part of conceptual work. That's the, also my, <clears throat> my really principle that the political understanding of what's going on is part of conceptual work. Politics and analysis are not separate. I've written about this too, by the way. If people are interested, I'll send them the work. So if we understand that there is, yes, indeed, there is a right-wing assault but what there is also is really a very deep crisis of capitalism. And we need to kind of be empowered to understand that we new, need new arrangements. You don't believe me, listen to Greta Thunberg, okay? I mean, we are really at the end of the ropes. And yes, people were saying it for many years that the capitalism will end and we see it needs to end now. 
So we need to take an activist position then and be uh, those who want, I'm not imposing it on you, but take an active explicit position without imposing it, but being clear about the um, direction of what you want to move to. Uh, it's a struggle. It's a struggle in schools every day. Every day we come to classrooms. I do it almost every day, working with those who work in classrooms and through them working with those oppressed children together with them, where by the way, the suicide rate in middle school in America is off the roof. Suicide in middle school, pre-adolescent is through the roof. We are at a horrible, horrible crisis of these students who commit suicide. And I work with those who have students commit suicide. So it's a fight and a struggle. First thing is to understand we are in the midst of a struggle and a fight. Even in the classroom, it's a site of struggle. Also, where uh, teachers need to have a voice also and a position and also develop solidarity. That's what we do in urban education at CUNY, which is not neutral, which is very political, and our students are leading the way. Please come and visit, and you will be amazed what's going on in the urban education at CUNY and with the students who we are lucky to work with who are activists in Black Lives Matter, in uh, demonstrations, and every day in their classroom. What is the fight in the classroom? When we come and see the injustices and we acknowledge them and understand that students are treated unequally, that they are in a situation of oppression, when this is acknowledged and we push back, that is part of the struggle. So it's much more than just a word of translation here or there. That's the gist of Vygotsky and Freyra. That's what they did. I mean, Peter, I, I totally disagree with many points that Peter said. That's OK. He, I'm sure he disagrees with me. That's fine. These are different takes on Vygotsky. Uh, and uh, you, it's also perfectly fine to disagree. But of course, um, I, I hope you can see that there is a difference. So yes, I am uh, um, working together with those who are um, realizing that uh, we need a radical change and uh, conceptual work that is uh, establishing that all children require, uh, require and demand equal treatment. That's part of the revolution too. Demand anti-racist uh, position here, of course, and um, no small changes to cover up with little paint uh, will solve the situation. So that's just part of that uh, question. Whether Freire was a Marxist, someone wrote, oh, yes, uh, Freire uh, was idealist because someone else was a Marxist and Freire was idealist. Well, Marx was idealist too, to some extent. Okay, if you really know Marx, you would know that Marx was not about this stupid one-sided a view that it's all about uh, material, uh, you know, forces that uh, as if it was it. No, Marx is a very deep humanistic philosophy of freedom, but it takes a lot to see it and to read it. I'll give you resources and uh, references to read, for example, works on ethics in Marx by Blackledge and uh, just one reference, but they are wonderful. There is a new scholarship now because that's what I want to say. After the fall of the Soviet Union, what happened for 30 years, from 91 to 2008, this is almost 30 years, this was the time of the end of history, end of history. That was the spirit, the zeitgeist, end of story. We know that the, the capitalist worldview is what we need. Western democracy is perfect. Well, not so fast. Uh, because we see the problems now. American history is rewritten now. And thanks to uh, people like Noam Chomsky, Howard Zinn, and I know Peter is reading that too. It really has to be rewritten, uh, showing, uh, of course, the, what happened and why. And uh, 
we need to understand all of us together need to think about new ways, not to repeat. Nobody said, here, just re let's repeat the Soviet Union experience. No, but let's learn from the lessons of the attempts, including in South America, by the way, of what is possible, what can be done. Let's not rush to judgment and just dismiss what was done in the Soviet Union or in Cuba or in Venezuela or in uh, uh, Nicaragua or in Brazil also now with the new social movements and, uh, and so on. Let's, uh, let's take them more seriously because we know that capitalism is killing the planet. I'm sorry, it is. Mm -hmm. I can imagine people are getting tired of this, but uh, I guess that's, um, that's the spirit here. So when I said Marx was idealist, yes, well, I, uh, that's, uh, if you're interested, I'll give you, and of, you'll find it in my book also, a discussion of worldview, what is reality and how subjectivity and objectivity emerged in Marxism uh, so that they form a subjectivity, S slash objectivity, where values are at the center of reality, of materiality. The values are material, and ma but what is material is much broader than we used to think. It's not something just to touch. Uh, material is uh, the notion that, that is uh, very radical. You can, of course, read French Marxist, Badiou, G, well, Badiou and uh, Balibar. Uh, there are wonderful works, of course. Uh, a little bit of Zizek doesn't hurt, but uh, although I disagree with many things, but you, you, we need to engage also with new uh, developments in Marxism, which is a fresh wave now that people know we are not at the end of the world and, and capitalism is not the solution. Now there are these amazing voices, but also of course, yes, voices from the global south. Yes, and I do read a lot of... Uh, Mm, uh, uh, scholars in uh, Spanish, less in Portuguese now, but yes, Chicana feminist philosophers, such as uh, Maria Lugona, such as, uh, uh, as I said already, Anzaldue and Audre Lorde, but also many works you can find uh, uh, in reference and discuss them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. Do you have any more questions to answer? Maybe Peter. To make a yes. question, yes, someone uh, right. Okay, Peter, do you want please to, to answer the question, Aline's question? Well, there was uh, the only question I saw directed to me um, I have to scroll back up. There's been a lot of additions since it was posed. Um, but it had to do with whether I did see room to make sense of the two together. Uh, I believe that was a question. Did I get that? I got that right, Elizabeth? I, I have to. Yeah, okay, yes. Here's the there, question. You talk about the difference. There was a, one question the... from Aline, and now another question from Kari. Okay. Um, so, uh, so first, just to back up a little bit, um, my goal was not to explain why capitalism is bad, but uh, I think it's pretty obvious. I know. It's I know. flawed. Uh, yeah. My goal is not to say whether we should be communists or capitalists. Right. I did not interpret this meeting to be anything about those issues. So um, I'm not an economist. I'm not a political philosopher. I. Uh, I don't have much to add to that conversation. Um, I think it's pretty clear capitalism produces inequities. That's been known for 150 years at least. Uh, so th there's not much more for me to say other than, yeah, sure, capitalism has problems. Um, I would say that communism did too. Uh, and I'm not sure that I've talked a little bit with Anna about this. To me, it's not whether this system is better than that, but who, what kind of people populate each? And um, I think the problem is not at the political, at the... the...